right, guys, we're back. It's another episode of the Fearless Pursuit of Freedom podcast. And today's guest is, of course, another high-level entrepreneur uh, out of the DFW Metroplex area here in Texas. Uh, we got Lance Wakefield with us with uh, Win Win Home Buyers. How's it going, man? Thanks for coming on. It's going great, man. Thanks for having me. Yeah. So, uh, like discussed a couple seconds ago, um, just go into uh, who you are, what you're doing in the real estate world, and why you chose real estate. Some people think we're crazy. And then uh, where you want it to go from there. All right. Yeah. So um, I chose real estate um, because I like tangible assets. I don't like stocks and those sorts of things. It just right. like, I can't quite wrap my head around it as well. So um, I like real estate for that. I also like the freedom aspect, the passivity that can be found in it. So there's a lot of good things about real estate that, um, got me into it. Um, I got into it full time in 2016. Um, but I bought my first, my first property when I was 21 in 2008 or nine, I think it was, the, I think it was like December, 2008. So okay. right as everything was, um, nose diving. Yeah. So yeah. yeah, that's kind of where I got started. I, I kept that property for, um, almost 10 years, had that yeah. property for about eight years and sold it. And, nice. um, that's kind of what got me into it. Doing that was, was awesome because it was like a, it was a house hack. Uh, yeah. I lived in it, uh, while I was going to college, it was right next to the university. And I like the house was, it was a big house. It was like 3000 square feet, six bedroom, four bath, four bath, just yeah. stacked it with guys. We had like yeah. 10 guys living in it. And, yeah. um, it just, they, each of them paid a few hundred bucks rent and, Across, you know, 10 guys that adds up and the mortgage was like a thousand bucks. I took over the mortgage and worked out well. So that's awesome. Yeah, man. Yeah. That's kind of how I got in was kind of a, I did a sub two deal. I didn't even know what it was at the time really? uh, and just kind of did it and ended up working out really well. And I learned, you know, 10 years later what a sub two deal was. <laughs> that's strange. I mean, I always wonder like, cause when I was 21, I don't know what the hell I was doing, but then I hear stories like yours buying houses and then just it just comes to mind like, hey, I'm gonna get ten people in here to pay my mortgage. And oh, by the way, I bought it uh, sub two, and I had no idea what sub two is. It's yeah, funny it was, how some people think about those strategies. Yeah, early it, on. Was, it was more just kind of like, hey, um, can you pay the mortgage? I was like, can I can pay the mortgage, like because mm -hmm. I could, I knew I could rent it out. Just, yeah, yeah, I can pay it. They're like, so it was just like, okay, well, take it over. I'm like, okay, great, cool with that. Yeah. Easy enough. That really well. What? Yeah. I said easy enough. Yeah. It was 2008, man. So people were like freaking out. Everyone's losing homes. And so it was a little bit different climate than it is right now. Yeah, of course. Yep. And so, so uh, 2016 rolls around you want to go full time. Yeah. I'd moved to Texas by this time. I'd had, uh, I'd done, I'd done other business stuff. I'd had, I'd flipped, I flipped a house in Arizona in 2010, I think, mm -hmm. uh, remotely from, I was living in Utah. I flipped a house remotely in Arizona and that went okay. You know, I was, it wasn't well enough, but I did it again, but it wasn't so bad that I was like, Hey, I never want to be involved in real estate again. All right. Um, and then in 2015, a buddy of mine who's, who'd bought a home in 2008 or not, no, 2010 or something, um, during the Obama, you know, when they were trying to stimulate things, they gave the 7,500 whatever yeah. back or whatever that was, he bought a yeah. home and he half flipped it and then ran out of cash. And I'd had a lot of like life changing circumstances happen during that time, like divorce, uh, lost friends and my brother and lots of things happened that kind of brought me to a point where, um, my car dealership life wasn't really going to work out anymore. Right. And so I was like, okay, you know, I'll, I'll try flipping a house. And so we flipped his house. And after, after that, I decided I want to be involved more full time. This was still in Utah. I moved down to Texas and, yeah. and, um, I started, I did my, we bought our first place a few months after I moved to Texas and then just kind of started doing more and more, quit my job and went full time and never looked back. Really? That's awesome. So what made you, what made you move to Texas? Um, it was a family thing. Like my ex had left with my daughter to Texas. So the only, I wanted to be in, involved in her life. I'd yeah. gotten married. We had a child on the way. And the day that my second child was born, I quit my job and was like, I'm, burning the boats, sink or swim, got to make it work. And yeah. that was, uh, that was October. 
and I had some, re- I'd, I'd, I'd been working in the remodeling industry. And so I had some remodeling jobs that kind of kept the bills paid if sort of barely. And right. um, I did a little bit of marketing at the very beginning of 2016. I did my first direct mail campaign and I ended up getting four deals from it. And from those four deals, I, did, I spent 2000 bucks on direct mail. And from the four deals I got from it, um, I made over a hundred grand. And just never looked back. Just kind of going. Bad. Not bad. I've never, I've never seen um, what is that like a uh, a fifty, a fifty dollars back for every dollar spent on marketing. I've never seen that return again since then. Yeah, since then, yeah. But, um, but it worked out. It, it frankly, that that seed money launched me. It got me yeah. going. It got me dollars for marketing. It got me everything that I needed so that I could build the business. And. Yeah. I had no clue what I was doing. I didn't even know what an assignment was. I wasn't even contracting those properties to wholesale them. I was contracting them to flip them. Yeah. And people just kept offering me money for the properties. And I was like, hey, pay me 25K over what I bought it for and I'll sell it to you. And they kept saying yes. So I kept I kept signing assignments. I didn't even have an assignment. I like found one on, I don't even know where. And it was so poorly done, but I made it through somehow. Well, that's a testament of, uh, you know, just jumping off of the cliff and, and trying to find out a way to fly on the way down. Because most people, I mean, even I did it. I mean, I moved to Texas, similar story, at, right after divorce, came to Texas, December 2015. So all of 2016, I was trying to figure out the realtor thing. But that year, I was like, I don't know if I want to put the money into it. I don't really know what an assignment is. I don't know much about real estate. I barely even know how to comp houses. And uh, I wish I would have just jumped right on it like you did because I would have been a little further ahead, but that's awesome, man. And, uh, yeah, so, yeah, there, so I ended up, so I did my first, uh, deal in 2000 of March, 2016, the first one closed. And by the end of March, we, we did like a hundred grand, which was great. And then, yeah. um, and then the rest of the year we continued it on, like we kept doing deals. And by, I think, I think we closed out 2016 at right at a million dollars in revenue. So yeah. every month, just kept kept going and first year that's great really well it was a mixture the revenue came from a mixture of things we did do um i think we did a few flips during that and then my wife um my wife was an agent she just got her license in december of 15 yeah and so uh we also got her a lot of listings and got a lot of income from doing listings and stuff like that too yeah and uh but it ended up uh great year and um, at the end of that year i I started with a business partner and we started Shoreline Property Group. Mm-hmm. And um, he brought in some capital. I brought in some know-how. And we, in 2017, we did several, I don't know exactly how many wholesales we did. I'd have to look, but it was it was around 150 to 170 wholesale deals in 2017. Jesus. And, and that's here in uh, Dallas? That's all, all. Most here in Dallas. We did some stuff in Houston because Harvey hit in 2017. Yeah. And so, um there was just a lot of deals in the market. So we did probably do on a 20 or 30 in Houston yeah. area, but most of them were in DFW. Yeah. I gotta make, I gotta make a note to bring that back up. Okay. <laughs> Cause, uh, not only do a lot of people, um, take their time and, uh, they get into that uh, paralysis analysis mindset type of deal, um, just in their local market. And then you did, 20, 30 deals. What's Houston's what, four, six hours away or something. Yeah. Four we hours. actually, we actually signed over a hundred contracts in Houston, but because yeah. so many, there are so many deals on the market. Yeah. Like you didn't need a wholesaler right after Harvey hit. I mean, you could just, you could go ask your neighbor basically. And from your network, you could get deals just flowing in and yeah. don't get me wrong. There's still a market for it. And we still did wholesale deals, but we, there's a lot of learning that happened doing well yeah. sailing during that crazy time. There's a lot of kind of things going on to it. Yeah. And so definitely a lot of learning happened, but it, it overall was really mostly learning experience. Yeah, like we made money, but it wasn't like, Oh man, we made so much money. We got to keep doing this. It was like, yeah, we covered our marketing. We bought a buyer's list in Houston. We had to pay for that through it. And so yeah. we ended up making money, but it wasn't like we got rich off of it. Right. Right. Um, so I know me and you talked, uh, I don't know, some point last year, um, 
at, at that time you were still primarily doing wholesaling, you wanting into flipping. How's that uh, evolution evolved there? I mean, have you gotten into flipping more? Yeah, I feel like in DFW, from what I've, I've noticed, I feel like especially um, since 2019 got started in the very end of 2018, the wholesale market has, from what I feel, I feel like it's slowed down a bit. There's more wholesalers and um, yeah. buyers want better discounts and stuff now. So yeah. I'm wholesaling less because of that and flipping more. Um, because the deal still, the, the, the retail market is still there, but yeah. the market is less there. Don't get me wrong, it's still there. You can still wholesale deals for sure. Yeah. Uh, it's just not as powerful as it was. Right. So. Yeah. I'm hearing the same thing from a multitude of people. Um, yeah. Yeah. A lot of the big companies are that were moving, you know, 20, 30 a month are having some issues moving them now. Yeah. Yeah. There's just, there's less buyers. I mean, like our open rates have gone down on emails we send out the amount of responses we get per open have gone down. Everything's gone down and there's still quality properties, quality deals, quality numbers and, and all that's there. But, um, you know, there's a lot of different sentiment in the market right now. And, yeah. um, so we're just kind of aware of that and still need to monetize the marketing dollars. So yeah. one way to do it and wholetailing is another way to do it. Yeah. Yeah. I like, I, I do all three models well, but wholetailing, you know, if you get it that good enough price and it's not a seriously crazy rehab, it's an easy hotel all day right now. Yep. Under yep. certain price points, but yeah, yep. that's what I've been doing. Like my, I, I love those homes that are built in like 1999 to like 2008. Yeah. You know, that era of build. And if you're in that right price point, you know, you get in paint and carpet maybe, and then yep. throw it on the market and and they fly off the shelf if they're under, you know, 250 or so. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's my mindset too. Yeah. 225 is probably my breaking point right now. Yeah. Uh, everything above that just is getting wonky. I'm being very, very picky right now. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so let's rewind a little bit. <clears throat> what were, I know with me and even to this day, marketing has been a bear. What are some of the hurdles that you were going through in uh, 2016? Because I mean, you did great, but I'm sure there was a ton of headache. Um, yeah, lots of mistakes. Yeah, yeah, lots of wasted money. Oh, yeah. For me it was. <laughs> I, I did something very different, and it was, so like I've never been, like the first time I ever went to like a real estate seminar where people sell coaching and stuff, Yeah. when I was speaking at, like I'd never been to one before, I never even knew what they were. Right. And so um, I went to, um, how I found, how I kind of got my marketing engine going back then was I heard this dude on a podcast in, in Georgia who said he had it nailed, like dialed how to do it. Yeah. And I totally drank the Kool-Aid and called him, cut him a check from that hundred grand that I made. I cut him a check for 20 and he started marketing for me. And, um, obviously I was overpaying for the marketing but it still brought in deals. And because I had made commitments to him, it kept my marketing budget consistent during that time when I probably would not have kept it consistent otherwise. Right. And so even though I was overpaying for it, it still forced me to do marketing, which of course to pay for the marketing is forcing me to do deals and so on. It kind of, it got me into the, the cycle of doing yeah. deals, I guess. And so it, I wouldn't really recommend that method with that person, but what it forced me to do ended up being really good for me. Yeah, a little, a little bit of forced accountability, especially if you got that kind of that kind of change on the line there. Yeah, I mean, can you imagine the accountability from the wife? <laughs> right. and, uh, you did you what today? A Twenty grand check, bro. You're gonna, you're gonna. Yeah. Warm. <laughs> right. That's nuts. Yeah, that's cool. Um. I was gonna ask you about your marketing, but I want to, you know, give away all your all of your secrets. But like, I don't really. For, have, I don't think there are any marketing secrets. <laughs> right. Uh, so for like for me, it's um, uh, you know, direct mail was working great early last year into 2017. Now it's like basically garbage to me because there's so many wholesalers doing the same thing. Um, so then I merged into ringless voicemail, mass texting. It was like bandit signs, door hangers. Um, I, I, at one point I was emailing every single realtor in the Northern Texas area every single week. It was, um, so there was this evolution of, well, what works now? What works now? What works now? 
Yep. Do you find that same thing or do you? Totally. Exact same thing. Like I still do direct mail, but not yep. as much as I used to. All right. In 2017, there were months where I dropped 150,000 postcards in a month. And so it's like, no, I'm not doing anywhere near that right now. Right. Yeah. Because it just doesn't have the same return. So I've dabbled in some of the same things that you've mentioned, as well as like cold calling and some of these different things, just trying to look at my cost per acquisition. And, and you know, it's really good to do the experimentation. Yeah. But it also affects the type of leads that come in when you're experimenting. Like when I'm direct mailing, it, it results in one type of lead. And yeah. how you acquisition and convert that lead to a deal is different than with um, a cold call lead. Those are very yeah. different acquisition methods. Um, and so it, it also creates a lot of confusion with acquisition guys, like how to work each lead when yeah. you're, you're switching them all up. So I know that staying ahead of the curve is important, but also having some of those strong steady that those are your big deal. Those are, that's your main kind of deal flow with one marketing vein. Yeah. And experimenting with others is always good. And if you get one that fits in really well with your system, that's yeah. phenomenal. But it's not just the marketing method. It's how well your system can work those leads too. So there's, right. there's a lot of factors to marketing. But I think sometimes people just look at, hey, this is super cheap and so I should do it. And it's like, right. well, if the system's not built to do it, it doesn't mean you're going to convert that super cheap marketing into deals still. Right. So, yeah, I've noticed that does... Um, I've really actually now my VAs, um, we used to just mass mail every single foreclosure. And I'm like, why are we doing this? We got to make sure there's, cause I'm not a huge fan of subject two. I don't want the headache. I don't want the liability. And, uh, I think there's just enough deals out there to not have to go into subject two. Unless it's like a sweet deal. You're getting like a, a bomb, like 2005 house that you know is in a neighborhood going to appreciate and you can pull it off. But to me, I think there's enough deals. So I was like, well, why am I? Because I use a Propelio list and Propelio have, will have on the substitute trustees, the appraised value versus the original loan value. So I even had my VA start going there and not only pull out everything appraised above 300,000 because I don't want to mess around that market, but then ones that had obvious equity um, just to alleviate some of that wasted money. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a lot of things like that where so to me, the best thing you can do with your, to, to stay relevant with your marketing is mm -hmm. um, the unique, uniqueness of your list. So earlier you had mentioned that um, direct mail doesn't work anymore because it's just getting hit so hard. Yeah. Um, and if you're using the same list that everybody else is using, yeah. of course. But if you have a way to find a more unique type of list or you can pinpoint people in a way that others can't, mm -hmm. that's where your direct mail is still lucrative in my opinion. Even yeah. You just can't, you've got to have a list that's more unique than, you know, the obvious stuff that you hear all the time because yeah, everyone knows that and everyone's already using that. So yeah. Well, yeah, you Google wholesaling and people say foreclosures, probates, high equity, and non owner occupants. Yep. Uh, that's the list everybody mails. Yep. And uh, it's hard to win when you've got a ton of competition. Yeah. When you can find niches where there's less competition, it's a lot easier to make deals and make things happen. So, yeah. yeah every that's time I hear that, what I look for. Right. Yeah. Every time I hear the word niches, I'm like, snitches get stitches <laughs> yeah. for some reason. Every time I hear niches, I'm like, it's the first thing that goes to mind. Yeah. yeah the same deal for me is like um, finding your niche. I mean, for me, it was an evolution of different marketing strategy, but also building up a system that was sustainable without a whole lot of my input. And I noticed you work from the office too. Um, it, my goal has never been to build this huge system, but something that was streamlined and effective without wasting time and money. Um, so you, you're in your office now. Yeah. Do you, do you have any intentions of growing into the skyscrapers type office or do you want to keep a small and uh, just a small family of you and employees? Um, I've had the big skyscraper office. Um, I've had the home office. I, so I actually split off from shoreline in the beginning of 2018. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, 
went into like a skyscraper office type of thing. I, I was there for a while and, um, and just kind of changed my model. Like having a big business that has a lot of overhead has its advantages because there's scale and things that can come from it when you're yeah. not on the overhead, but it also requires you to do a certain volume. Yeah. Um, you know, I found that having a lower volume, doing some bigger deals and just having a few people rather than having a, you know, 20 person team, mm -hmm. um, has been more my speed for the last year. Like it just has felt better for me over the last year. So that's what yeah. I've been doing. Um, you know, will I ever return to it? I don't know. Um, right. my, my home office is pretty cool. It's totally separate from my house. It's, um, it's heated cool. It's a 1300 square foot garage basically. Mm -hmm. but it, it works great. We can fit as many people as we need to in here for the size we're at right now. So yeah. I like it. Um, it, it works really well for us. So, yeah. <clears throat> so how's that structure? I mean, so uh, I've heard acquisition managers, what's your team look like? It's what's your position? Cause me, I've gotten halfway through the book traction, um, but I don't have a big team. It's me and Ashley. So um, I hadn't finished that book, but the concept of the book is to build the systems and have the innovator uh, slash creator and the implementer. I assume mm -hmm. your position within the company is the integrator or the, not the integrator, the uh, uh, innovator, yeah. uh, the creative minds. And then you've got your, your innovative, your, your, your team that's implementing your, your ideas. Yeah. So let me tell you a little bit about what I'm currently doing and what, what's involved. So I do, I do wholesaling and flips here in DFW. Mm -hmm. I do buy and holds in um, Pittsburgh. So Interesting. that's kind of different. And the reason, the reason for that is because um, the cash flow that I can find there is more than I can get here. So, yeah. Um, my, my experience is in DFW is getting a rental that cash flows here. Um, you can do it, but your cash flow is generally, if, if the property is leveraged, is maybe 200 a month after you really account for everything. Yeah. The and, right way. Yeah. Yeah. And then, so, you know, just kind of in my head, I'm like, okay, well, if I want $20,000 a month of income, holy crap, I need a lot of property. Like, yeah. And getting to that point, buying one at a time would take years. Yep. Um, in Pittsburgh, I'm focusing more on buying groups like portfolios from old landlords. And the cash flow is just, there's just way more of it. You know, you can hit, we've bought deals there that hit, you know, are you familiar with the 1% rule or the 2% yeah. rule? Right, yeah. We've bought properties there that hit the 5% rule. Jesus. And so you don't, you just never don't. heard that. <laughs> Yeah, you don't even see that here. Yeah, and so, no, that doesn't exist. You know, you, you can buy properties there for 20 grand that rent for a thousand bucks a month. Yeah. Just you just don't, you would never see That's that nuts. in Dallas. But there's also zero appreciation there. Like zero. Right. And so like there's properties that I'm buying that I'm buying for the same price that sold for in 1975. Same price. Like yeah. no appreciation whatsoever. Am I buying them below market? A little bit, but not crazy, you know? Yeah. And well, so you just cash flow and use that cash flow to buy it down and eventually you'll have your 15 K in equity and you just sell them in 30 years. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. That's, that's kind of the plan we're running there. And we're buying, um, I'm closing on 23 out there, um, mm -hmm. uh, next week. And then we've got some other portfolios we're working on buying out there. And so our goal, my goal is to have a hundred units out there by, uh, the end of, or by June 15th. That'll put my it's awesome. hundred units in a hundred days. Yeah. Kind of my goal awesome. right there. So we're trying to get there. I've got a partner there. Uh, he's a guy that I coached with for, um, I'm coaching him. I coached him for a year or so. Yeah. Now he's wholesaling out there. He's very successful and him and I are buying properties out there together. Now. So yeah, that was, that was me my next question. So are you, uh, so you, you've, you've been coaching for a year. So I assume he's doing all the, all the marketing you're bringing to the capital end of it and the, and uh, the management or, or is he managing? Sort of. We've, we found a property manager. Um, yeah. we're, we're, I've got actually two acquisition managers that buy properties remotely for us. And um, so I do marketing in Pittsburgh. He yeah. does dispositions. And then my marketing goes to my acquisitions. My acquisitions were both remote. 
Um, they buy the properties in Pittsburgh, um, contract them, and um, then he his team sells the properties. So yeah. we're doing some remote, remote wholesaling there. And then yeah. obviously when we can find those package deals, we're, we're keeping them and closing on them. Yeah. As well going there. So That's I awesome. do wholesale there too. Um, I don't flip there. I've never done a flip there, but I wholesale yeah. there and I, um, I wholesale and I buy and hold there. I do have buy and holds in DFW. I do like, like you were talking earlier, I've had some sub two deals and different things like that here. Yeah. But, uh, and those I want for the appreciation because I know I'm not going to get that. And right. in, so no, that's awesome. Yeah. I've heard of, well, I know quite a bit of people that are in those, um, in those markets where you get the two to 3%. I mean, I never heard everybody really say I'm getting 5%. It's nuts. It's not, it's not normal. Not for 5% of the money, the 5% rule. And then should we probably explain that? So the 1% rule is you buy a house for a hundred thousand, it rents for a thousand. 2% rule is you buy a house for a uh, thousand or a hundred thousand and rents for 2000. It's just unheard of. Typically it happens in 30, $40,000 ranges. You buy it for 30,000, it rents for 600. Yeah. So, Two percent or two times, yeah. Now there was a house. There's a house in Pittsburgh that um, my buddy contracted. Um, he contracted it for ten grand. It's renting for nine hundred a month, um, section eight, and he couldn't sell it. What? No one, what? No one would touch it. Unreal. It's in an area where no property managers would go. Like you yeah. have to like self manage, and it's super hood. But it's like yeah. that's crazy, right? Like. That's like a 9% rule deal. Like never. Yeah. What if, uh, I mean, why wouldn't, uh, you turn something like that into owner finance? Be like, Hey, you know, uh, you're paying 900 bucks a month. Why don't we, uh, sell this property to you for 18,000 owner finance over the next five years you pay. Cause it was section eight. So they're just too yeah. far under to even provide even a couple thousand dollar down payment. Yeah. They got nothing. Yeah. So yeah. it was just you know, overall, you know, I, I don't know that ins and outs of that deal. He just told me about it. And it's, you know, those deals do exist places. And, yeah. you know, for if, if you could find the right hungry investor, yeah, it'd be a great deal for them. Like, yeah, they're going to, there's some jagged edges on that. They're going to get broken off and they're going to have some pain, but you're going to learn a ton and you're still in a really good position on the deal. Like you one year you could, if you bought it cash, you could have all your money back in one year. Oh yeah. So it's, yeah, it's there's that's, a lot of power to that. Yeah. Hmm. So Yeah. And, and like you said, Texas is not super conducive to those kind of numbers. I mean, the taxes alone annihilate 300 to 600 bucks a year monthly cash mm -hmm. flow. Yep. And uh, so you really got to go into uh, the low end neighborhoods or like way tertiary far out markets. Yep. And uh, it's basically a virtual deal at that time anyway. So, yep. Like, and, and that's what I was like, we were talking about going into like Sherman Denison, which for those who don't know, it's probably a solid hour north of the Metroplex, like from downtown Dallas. It's yeah. probably an hour and a half um, north. It's right on the Oklahoma border, but you could still buy those, you know, twenty, thirty thousand dollar $30,000 homes that rent for, you know, six, seven, 800 bucks a month. Mm -hmm. And, but when I was looking at it, I was like, man, going out there is not that much different than like it is, don't get me wrong. It definitely takes me more time to get to Pittsburgh than it does to get to Sherman. But it, it, the returns that I saw from, from Pittsburgh were so much higher and it just, it didn't make sense to me. And it's not like I want to go out to my properties anyway. I have zero yeah. desire to ever go out to these properties. I'm buying them for the cash flow, not because I want to go be a handyman. Right. And you'll never drive that hour to Sherman. No, I, yeah. I wouldn't. And so I'd have to set up everything I would need to in Sherman that I would need to set up in Pittsburgh. So yeah. I'm like, well, it's just doing Pittsburgh because the numbers are better. There's, there's more deals. There's a huge economy in Pittsburgh. You know, it's yeah. 3 million people versus, I don't know how many are in Sherman, maybe a hundred thousand. Yeah, yeah, not much. And there, I know quite a few um, big players up there. So the competition is yeah. actually pretty strong up there. It has, yeah, over the last three years, it's gone from basically nothing to extremely competitive. And so, yeah. you know, whereas I, I just felt better in a different area where I already had somebody who knew the area. So, well, and he's working the way you want your company to be worked. You, I mean, you trained him for a year, basically. Yeah. So, yeah, no. that's a good thing for us. So, yeah. Okay. So I'm seeing a common theme here. It's all single families. Uh, any, any plans moving anything else or, 
Are you trying yeah, to? I've, I've, so I've dabbled a little bit in some other stuff. Like, you know, when you're wholesaling, I feel like wholesale is just like this net that catches everything, you know? Yeah. And so I've done commercial deals where we've wholesaled some, um, I think we wholesaled like a 20 unit um, in Grand Prairie. It was 16 unit. 16 unit in Grand Prairie. We've mm-hmm. done some other stuff like that. Um, I am interested in moving to commercial, um, but the timing for me is probably not exactly right right now. I'm interested in mobile home parks. I've been doing research on them and I'm, I'm putting offers or letters of intent out on those, but I haven't closed on anything yet. So yeah. there's definitely interest for me in moving into the commercial space, but um, for, for 2019, I'm single family all the way, unless I get a really sweet commercial deal that falls into my lap. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. I understand that. Uh, well, I mean, if you're buying a uh, hundred uh, houses in a hundred days out in, in Pittsburgh, then there's really no point in buying a measly 16 unit over here in DFW or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> Man. Yeah. So there's been I've, another thing I've really appreciated about Pittsburgh is um, the sellers are open to a lot of creativity and financing too. Really? Uh, and so let me, let me kind of break down this 23 unit. Yeah, um, I was going to ask you that too. Not, perfect. Cause it's really interesting how we did this and how we structured it. Um, and I didn't do it, my acquisition manager. So I'm not trying to say I'm brilliant. I think how he did it was brilliant. And we kind of, we worked on it together, you know, like, Hey, seller wants this, let's say this, you know, mm-hmm. back and forth. And so the seller came to us and this is in a little town called New Kensington. It's about 30 minutes outside of, um, Pittsburgh. Um, but it, it's, it's close. It's really close. It's definitely very reliant on the Pittsburgh, um, economy. Mm-hmm. And, um, uh, and so how this came, like, so first of all, this town, if you've ever watched, like, if you're watching any of those, like, opiate uh, epidemic um, documentaries, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> this town epitomizes those documentaries. Like, there's bandit signs in the town saying, don't use heroin. Like, it is, it's that kind of town. Sounds um, like Quinlan. What was that? Sounds like Quinlan, just, just uh, west of Lake Tawakini here in the DFW area. Yeah, yeah it's yeah. probably like that. <laughs> never been there, but yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of like that. It's, yeah. it's not a bad area. We never felt unsafe, Yeah, but it's definitely like a class C, C minus area. Right. <clears throat> several vacant homes, um, you know, several probably getting bulldozed that have these big red X's across the front. Yeah. A rougher area in that sense, but not, not in the sense of like, Hey, I'm worried about safety here. So right. felt super safe the whole time. Just kind of, uh, of an area. So right. this landlord who's at one point, I think he owned over a hundred properties in the area. He sold a lot of them off. And so these 23, um, units that we're buying, they're broken up between 12, um, parcels. Like some of them, it, it's just, it's how did they do things? They're a little different. So some of them have like a house in front and a house in back. And so it's like a duplex, but it's not a duplex. It's two separate homes, but they're on yeah. one parcel. And so it's just a mixture. I think our yeah. highest has four or five units in it. And our lowest is a single family and it's just kind of <laughs> random stuff. Right. And, um, so it's, we're buying the 23 units for 350 grand. And so uh, obviously, okay. um, the, the rental income on them is 16,000 a month when they're all fully leased. Jeez. So you can see the numbers are strong. Yeah. Um, that's almost five. Yeah. So, um, which is obviously where the interest comes from. It's like, dang, right. like, yeah, yeah. And so, um, but how we finance this was really cool. So the seller was willing to carry, but he wanted significant skin in the games. He didn't want them to end up in his possession again. He's like, if I'm selling. I want them. I want to know you're not coming back. So what we ended up working out was a $350,000 um, purchase price. And, um, I think 30% down. I don't know exactly how the numbers shake out in percentages, but it's $105,000 down payment. Mm-hmm. So with the 105 down, um, there's a $245,000 note that he has in place. And so what we did is we said, okay, your $245,000 note is going to be cross collateralized by eight of these parcels. The other four, we're going to get free and clear. Yeah. So we take those free and clear parcels. We use our cash. We, we put a hundred and it's going to probably be like 115 to close after closing costs and everything. Yeah. So put 115 down. Those four parcels that we're buying for 115 should appraise for between 160 and 190. 
And so we've already got a bank lined up that will refinance us out after 30 days. So you basically bought these, actually got paid to buy these essentially. A little bit of homework. We, we may have to, we might be out of pocket. Um, so me and the guy in Pittsburgh are each buying them. We may be out of pocket five grand each is what we're looking at as our worst case scenario. And they cash flow well. Beautiful. And beautiful. so it's like, it's a really beautiful deal. And yeah. <laughs> like, I, I can't complain about that. And then we've got right now in another town, a little further outside of Pittsburgh, we're doing the same thing, a bigger scale with a 62 unit portfolio. Yeah. So <laughs> our goal is we don't have the contract done yet on that one, but like we're close. I think we should end up contracting it. We're using the same strategy. And now I'm like all about the strategy. I'm like, this is brilliant. You bring in yeah. private money if you need to, because the 62 units like a half, going to be a half million dollars down. So yeah. I need to bring private money to do it. But the bank will still refi that private money back out in 30 to 60 days. And so it's a really strong deal for everybody involved. Yeah. So, oh, that's awesome. It, it warms my heart, man. People getting creative because it's one of those things that when people are getting the real estate, they're like, oh, I need to have like a hundred grand to go buy my first rental property. I'm like, no, you don't. I mean, like wholesale, get a couple bucks in the bank, then go buy a flip, get some more bucks in the bank, then just, you know, snowball it and, yep. uh, and try not to make any mistakes. Of course you will. But um, that was one of my deals uh, all along as well. But especially when I was like, I'm going to get into, into, into commercial deals, but man, those are some bigger price points. And so I postponed, posting, you know, progressing, progressing. And uh, finally, I just started making offers on stuff. And uh, uh, crossed my fingers, I got one seller to accept a 0% down on a storage facility. I'm like, why didn't I just do that two years ago? Like, what the hell? Yeah. So, and yours is freaking badass because he wants the skin of the game, but you figure out a way to pull your skin back out of the game. So, yeah, it's a sweet deal. That's awesome. Yeah. You and just got to get super creative. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's create, but it, I feel like when you've got a single family house, your creativity is limited at some point because it's yeah. like, okay, well, you, no one wants a second position lien. Right. Yeah. And you can't, you can, you can do a fractionalized note. Right. But no bank's going to participate in a fractionalized note. Mm. And so it's like, it just gets complicated. Yeah. Whereas when you've got, even when you've got four homes, it's like, okay, well, you can split it up when you've got commercial real estate. You could, there's ways to be more creative in some yep. of these larger spaces. And then by nature, I think they're also less competitive because like dude, how many people can really come in and be like, I'm going to buy your 62 unit portfolio. Yeah. Not many people. No one home. Okay. There's potentially millions of buyers for a single. Home. Yeah. But once you talk about multiple and you're, you're, it's, it's the niche stuff we were talking about earlier. How many people are really marketing to do that specific thing? There's just less. Right. And so by nature, you're going to, you should be getting more deals. Yeah. Well, yeah, it's, yeah. Like you said, it's, you go talk to somebody going to foreclosure on their house. Not only is there a tremendous amount of emotions involved, but you're like, Hey, you know, there's like, not really a good way to pull this off unless you own or finance me the house or I take over payments. And they're like, Huh? It's like, you know, in one ear, out the other, they don't understand it. So I like when I'm talking to these, you know, it doesn't matter if it's mobile home park, store facility, they're almost always semi-educated in the real estate. So these terms don't, they're not, you know, foreign language to them and you can get as creative as, as can be. It's amazing. Yep. And these old timers, a lot of them, and here, here's another thing that's really helpful is people who own these cash flowing assets. Well, why do you think they bought those for the cash flow? Yeah. You know? And they, don't, they, they like the cash flow. And so seller financing is their perfect world, but they don't have to deal with all the bull crap anymore and they yeah. still get the cash flow. Exactly. And so persuading them to do that, especially when they own these larger assets where there's capital, capital gains tax, like mm -hmm. it's not hard. It's like, okay, well, I can give you a million dollars for this property and you know that you're going to go pay Uncle Sam. 39% of it, mm. or you could finance it to me and keep it all. Plus I'll pay you interest. So end up netting even more than a million versus the roughly 600,000 you would net if you just sold to me cash. And they're like, let's do it. Uh, yeah. Right. No yeah. headache. Keep money coming in, not paying Uncle Sam. I mean, like, there's all it's these no pros for them. Yeah. 
Yeah. And so for them, it, it works great, you know, and there's so many people in that position now that it's just like, well, ask them, you know, they're older, they, they can't maintain the properties, but they like the income they're getting from them. So it's not, exactly. it's not this huge leap where it's like, Hey, finance this. And they're like, well, no. right. Also well, want to know what you'll say, what you'll offer. Right. Yeah. That's my, um, that's my exact not my exact verbiage, but that's what my, my marketing says to these deals is, Hey, so you want to sell? And if so, you want to avoid some capital gains, you want to do some owner financing. And, um, uh, it's not the exact phrase and it's a couple paragraphs and a little more personal, or not a little more uh, professional. I mean, but, um, yeah, that's what it is. And, I, and a lot of the phone calls are, Hey, yeah, I do want to sell this. And, uh, let's talk about those owner finance terms. I'm like, Oh snap! It just got real, and it's it's yep. exciting. It reignites uh, the fuel uh, for uh, my love for real estate. Yeah, man, because it's like the speed at which you can build wealth when you can get these properties added. It doesn't have to be a huge discount. You know, you can be buying them at eighty-five cents on the dollar when they're seller finance. You know, the cash flows there. It yeah. makes sense. Right. It's, it's like you know, and if you're a million-dollar property, it's worth a million bucks. You could sell it for a million bucks on the market right now, and you're buying it for. You know, 850, it's like, eh, that's a little high. I'd be uncomfortable. I would have right. to know that I'm safe holding this property for a long period of time to be okay at that. Right. As long as all that felt good, why not? Like, yeah. it's going to pay itself down over time. You're going to improve your equity position in the property. Right. It's, it's winning all the way around, man. That's that's what I look for. That's why, yeah. hence the name of the company. Win win. Yep. I'm always win. looking for a win win. And if there's not a win for me and the seller, I'm just not interested. Yeah. Um, yeah, same, same deal here is, um, which is a lot of, a lot of the reason I don't like marketing to foreclosures because it's always such a stressful situation for the seller. It turns into a stressful situation for me. And then I'm in this mad dash because you know, they're the ones that call the last seven days before the foreclosure in panic mode. I'm like, yeah. man, this can be like, you waited too long. It's going to be hard for me to create that win-win. Like, I need to think about me at this point because I got a week to pull this thing off. It's mm -hmm. nuts. Yeah, it, it definitely, I hear you with the foreclosure stuff. It's always nice to find the people who are in foreclosure that understand that that's what's going to happen and that they're willing to work with you, you know, 20, 30 days before the foreclosure. Whereas you got those who are like three days before they're like, let's do this. Yeah. Dude, you waited. Little late. Yeah. Dug your own grave. So. Yeah. Well, man, that's awesome. Um, I probably should have dug into like, cause you track your KPIs like really well. It sounds like. And I did okay. I did okay. I'm not, I'm, I'm much better at KPIs now. Mm -hmm. um, I wish I would have had better KPIs during 2017. We were doing a ton of deals. Yeah. But, um, yeah. I did okay. on tracking KPIs. Yeah. That's a good point. Cause, and I was going to ask you is like, did you start out that way? Because I know myself is I got a rough idea of like what I do, but actually tracking how many mail pieces go out or how many cold calls go out or this and that. I have no freaking idea. I just know that I spend roughly this a month and I get roughly this amount of deals a month. And, mm -hmm. and, uh, but I'm a, I'm a quality over quantity type of deal. So I'm doing like one or two a month. And, uh, so my KPIs don't really matter a whole lot to me, but it's a, it's a good point that you kind of progressively over time, uh, we're able to do that because, it's smart. I mean, I should be doing it. And now you know where your dollars are best spent. You know, if you're. Yep. And when, so in my experience, running a business where you've got you know, 20 people working for you without KPIs, you're crazy. Like it's, it's impossible. And you're yeah. guessing and praying. And sooner or later, you're going to guess wrong or prayers are going to stop getting in. Something's going to go sideways. Right. Right. When it's you doing it and you're doing one or two deals, there's enough knowledge and other things behind you that you can totally get away with it. Not right. saying you should, but you right. can. Um, and, and now like we do track it much better. And that's part of the foundation where it's like, okay, we're at a place where I feel really comfortable. I feel healthy to scale again and, and move back up. The only thing that makes me nervous in that right now is the investor buyer atmosphere. Like, yeah, just doesn't it's not how it used to be there's just not people who are interested in flipping as much anymore it's 
it slowed way down. Yeah. So that's kind of, and we don't know how to affect that. And so that's the, that's the thing I'm most nervous about with scaling up again. I'm not worried about getting deals. I'm not worried about the marketing. All of that's really not that hard. It's, Hey, what's going on with buyers and why aren't they, they wanting to move forward? Yeah. If they're not, that's fine. But then if, okay, now if I need to take properties to market, where's capital coming from to close on properties yeah. and on the market? And how are we, now we need to look at project management and keeping, keeping progress happening with all these projects at once. And it's, it's kind of a different business. It's like you got your wholesale business, and instead yeah. of disposition of the property out and not worrying about it anymore, it goes to a project manager who needs to have all their systems in line and they need to push it through. And then it needs to go to an agent to get sold. And it's like, right. man, it's a, it's a lot more moving parts and a lot more money and a lot more risk. Right. So, yeah. Yeah. The market's super uneasy right now. So um, yeah. like we discussed earlier, I mean, it'd be just the buyers aren't buying as much or they're just wanting to go back to where it should be better more profitable deals because they got to account for rehabs going over and days on market. Yeah. The cost of money. And they can't like before I felt like as a buyer, like you buy a deal and it's like, okay, in 2000, you know, 2016, if you bought something in, let's say in February or March, it's March 1st today. Right. Mm -hmm. So we buy something in March, by the time that things ready to go on the market in eight May or June, well, it's also gone up like 8% during that time. Right, yeah. So it's like, eh, even if you maybe were a little like on the fringe, the appreciation that you experienced during that time just kept pushing you forward. And yeah. I think we all know that that's not happening anymore. It's much more across yeah. the board. So right. there's not, you don't have that growth trajectory anymore. And so there's, I don't know, there's a lot of factors to it. Plus, everybody, I mean, anyone who's, who's been in the game for a while, I mean, you get, you can get 50 emails a day for wholesale deals now. And so it's like, yeah, yeah that's got to affect it too. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm just waiting for that to slow down. I actually sent all wholesale deals to an email that I just stopped checking because there's so many of them and I got tired of clicking, you know, crap deal, clicking out, going to the next one, crap deal, crap deal, crap deal. And, uh, there's, I don't know, what do you say? Less than a dozen, like actual good wholesalers in, in the Metroplex. Yeah. There's, there's, there's so much of the, um, you know, some of these big companies out there that everyone knows that's not, they're just not doing things in a way that is sustainable for an investor to work with them. Right. I feel like there's a lot of copycat of that going on thinking that that's okay. And it's just like, that doesn't work like that. And then for us, the other side is we're also not going to wholesale a deal for five grand. Like it's just a waste of time, like making yeah. three or $5,000 on a deal. It's just like, I mean, it happens occasionally where we miss estimate or, or whatever, and we can't take the deal down. But if I'm looking at a five thousand dollar offer from somebody, and I know if I if I take the deal down and do it myself, I can be doing thirty or forty thousand on that deal. Mm -hmm. Why would like it's just hard for me with our marketing dollars and everything to say, okay, yeah, I'll sell it for five. Because yeah. honestly, with cost per acquisition where it's at and the cost of owning a business and running it, that's yeah. a loss. <clears throat> like yeah. I deal at 5000 bucks, you're losing money. And if you don't think you are, maybe your time, maybe using your time or something to get those deals. Right. But at scale, you can't do that. Like you've got to have a, a way to generate these properties and that costs money. Right. And so... Yeah. Things have just got, things have shifted and it's going to be interesting to see who can adapt to the changes and survive and who fails. Yeah. Yeah. We're definitely, we're already seeing it um, across the board, across the nation, really. Mm -hmm. uh, the market hasn't really um, proved to the average Joe what's going on because people are still thinking they can sell their houses way above what it's actually worth right now. But the investors that are in tune with what's actually going on, are getting a little worried, which is why our buyer base is dwindling. Yep. And it, which I was talking with some other wholesalers and they, and they, they said it in a way that really makes a lot of sense to me. You got a market on the rise or a market on the decline. Mm -hmm. Either way, it's a really good market for wholesalers to do really well in. Right. Where up for a wholesaler is the top and bottom where it transitions from the up to the down. Yeah. That part stuff. And right now that's, I feel like kind of what's going on. Over the next several months, I feel like sellers are gonna we're gonna start 
really going to that direction. Right. Which would result in sellers being like, crap, I can't sell my home on the market. It's been sitting for nine months. Yep. And so what am I going to do? And they've got to go to a, a more investment friendly route or just make dramatic price reductions on the right. property market. And so I feel like we're going to, right now it's tough because sellers still think that the market's great and the yeah. investors know that it's not. And it's like, uh, we got to, yeah. we got to gap that somehow. Yeah. Well, yeah. And then the realtors are feeding it too. I mean, yeah, I'm a realtor. You're, you said your wife's a realtor. So if we go to a listing appointment. We're like, yeah, it's, it's we're definitely worth this. And, but the, that neighborhood's gone down 15, 20,000 since, you know, last August, probably. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Seeing the days of market. Yep. Well, well, man, I uh, don't want to take up too much more of your time. Uh, share some great, great nuggets. Um, if anybody wants to reach out to you, what's the best place for that? Um, best way is uh, Facebook, Lance Wakefield and Instagram. Um, win, win method at win, win method on Instagram. Those two methods are the best way to get a hold of me. Um, and I'm always looking for people in the Metroplex to like partner on and stuff with. That's one way I'm doing more flips yeah. is I'm partnering with guys. Like they bring, they bring the financing to the table. I bring the deal. And usually there's a mixture of project management involved. Yeah. I'm doing more of that stuff right now because <clears throat> it's how we're dispositioning deals. And so I'm yeah. looking more people to do that sort of thing with is, and then I'm always looking for more buyers and we try to keep our numbers really accurate and keep quality deals, um, you know, coming in, but, uh, need, need buyers to fuel the, that side of things for us. So. Right. Yeah, no, that's awesome. Cool. Um, I didn't know you had an IG, so I'll have to go to get, find that. And then, uh, one question I ask everybody at the end, kind of, uh, you know, bring our, not so serious conversation to a really serious conversation is um, if you had uh, if you had six months to live, what do you think you would do with it? Man, I um, I love traveling and experiencing the world, and yeah. I just saw on um, it was like some some travel app this hundred and a hundred and twenty day cruise around the yeah. entire world for twelve oh, yeah. bucks. How so much? Twelve thousand bucks. It's like a hundred bucks a day. Dude, that's nuts. It's nuts, right? And yeah. it's dude, it's the entire world, like everywhere in the world. You do North America, South America, like all the way up to Alaska, Japan, like China, down through to Australia, the French Polynesia, all that, and back up through India, over to Africa, Middle East, like back up yeah. through Europe, back down through, like it's incredible. And I would probably do something like that. And yeah. For, for a while with take the whole family, obviously mm -hmm. I would just sell everything, cash everything out. Um, obviously I have life insurance, so my wife would be fine. Right. Um, sell everything, take all the cash we have until I was going to die and take everyone I love and care about and go and do something cool like that. No. So yeah, sign me up for that. That's freaking awesome. That's my deal is travel. I mean, I want to see it all. Yeah. Yeah, man. Like I love that you have your pilot's license and, you just that's awesome, man. I'd love to do something like that. I I've thought about it. I just get those those un um, unpressurized cabins, man. They mess with my everything. I don't do yeah. I don't do so well in those. Well, I haven't been above. Uh, I think we've got three thousand feet so far, so it's not bad at three thousand. But once you get outside of uh, the private pilot and you start going in the commercial and stuff, and you start getting closer to ten thousand, that's where it's like, yeah, pressuring on your head, but. It's pretty awesome. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. <clears throat> yeah. Well, cool, man, man. In 10 years, we'll have to, we'll have to do a cruise around the world, man. Dude, done, done. Got, we've got a thousand units and we just take exactly. off go for 10 years. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's why I'm switching into commercial is like, I feel like, uh, I didn't tell you on here, but like, so 2017, I did 27 deals. That was a lot for me. 2018, I did about 13, but made more money. And so I'm like, I'm just going to continue that flow of making or doing less deals, making more money. So that's why I want to go into commercial. So my plan this year is actually do like five to 10 deals max and keep them all. And I want them to be commercial. So that way I can do that three month cruise around the world. And I'm not worrying about checking my email on my Facebook and making sure I'm getting the leads. And so, uh, that's my goal, man. Just Yeah, man. That's, that's so funny. Cause that's like the same mindset I have. And that's part of what, Obviously, returns in Pittsburgh are part yeah. of what drives me there, but right. I have to figure out how to make it passive and what difference does it make if I'm in Texas 
or if I'm on a boat in the middle of nowhere. Like, exactly. As long as I have an internet connection, it doesn't matter where I'm at. Right. And that's a big part of my motivation is if I force myself to buy out of state, I force myself to be passive. And if I force myself to do that, I get the freedom that I want. Yeah. It's kind of like this chain that I'm, I know myself well enough to know that if something's here and something goes wrong, I will want to go out and try and like check it out or whatever. And I don't want to have the option to do that. I want to be forced to run it remotely yeah. so that I have that freedom. Long yeah. That, that was my, uh, last year I went on a ton of vacations and that was my deal. It was like, I probably shouldn't be paying for all this and I'm probably, you know, shouldn't be taking this much time off work, but I'm like, it's forcing me to set up the systems I need in place to yeah. be able to take those somewhat stress-free, you know? So yeah, that's awesome, man. I love it. You I think love a lot, a lot of light. Yeah. Cool, man. I appreciate it. Get back yeah, to work. Thanks, man. Thanks, thanks for inviting me on, man. Yeah. I'll, uh, I'll see you. I'm sure I'll see you around. So you take care yeah. until I see you again. Yeah. All right, man. Catch you later. Thanks a lot.